Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk. Today, I'm very excited because I met this incredible man who is creating the future for us with kidney disease. His name is Dr. Roy Shuvo, and he is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the Kidney Project. So welcome to the show, Dr. Shuvo. Why, thank you, Laurie. Really a pleasure to be with you and your community. Well, you know, tell us a little bit about why you decided to start the Kidney Project, and what is the Kidney Project? Sure. So my training is actually as an engineer, and I work with medical devices. About a decade ago, I got aware of the burdens of dialysis and the challenges facing the kidney disease community and just realized that the cutting edge of engineering had not made it to the treatments that are available to kidney patients. And I felt uh, that with uh, I, could, I could make a contribution, so I partnered up with uh, clinicians and basic scientists. And over the course of the last uh, 10 years, we've decided that, you know, we can not only make an impact, but we can actually deliver on the promise of total renal replacement by taking advantage of cutting-edge engineering, coupling that with the latest advances in biology and medicine. And I've been at this for... Uh, a decade with colleagues both in nephrology, transplant, material science, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. Now, I saw a picture of what you're working on, and it looks like the size of a a little transistor radio, if people can remember what that looked like, because everybody, you know, uses their phone for everything now. And it basically is an implantable kidney. I mean, that's just amazing because there's such a long list of, um, you know, for people waiting for a, a real kidney. And how would that work? The device would just be implanted in you and work like an artificial kidney inside of you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So first of all, let me clarify. It's We call it the bioartificial kidney. It will be a small device approximately the size of a coffee cup, for those who do not recall this, you know, what transistor radios look like. Anyway, so it, it consists of two modules that work together to get rid of wastes. It's the first stage of the device, the first module, is a hemofilter that processes incoming blood to create an ultrafiltrate, which has all the toxins as well as water, sugars, and salts. Mm-hmm. The second stage is a bioreactor that's lined with kidney cells that processes this ultrafiltrate and sends back the sugars and salts into the blood and in the process concentrates the rest of it into what would call urine, which will be directed into the bladder for excretion. It's basically like you have a little chemist sitting in your body. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. Uh, it will, you know, or in, the, in our vision, it will, it will allow you to be mobile, uh, eat and drink freely, and give you uh, benefits that go beyond what dialysis today can provide and hopefully achieve many of the benefits of a transplant. So where are you with this product at the moment? So currently, we are still in the preclinical stage. We have tested the hemofiltration components and the bioreactor components separately, and we still need to integrate them into a single device that will be implanted and operate, uh, you know, in a large animal or human being. To date, we have demonstrated that the hemofilter works inside an animal Mm -hmm. uh, for about a month, and we are continuously building larger-scale devices to test the filter material for blood clot resistance because that's really important to avoid clots forming on the device. Right. For the cellular component, we're conducting experiments to demonstrate that our cells not only transport the water, sugars, and salts back into the blood, but we also demonstrate blockage of immunological molecules that can attack the cells in the bioreactor. We are comparing the conditions inside the bioreactor that allow for the cells to grow and remain healthy over a long period period of time. Are, Are these cells stem cells? 
So it's an interesting question. We actually have uh, a, a few possibilities. Our first best possibility is not to use stem cells, but to use cells that have been isolated from a cadaver kidney and grown in the lab and seeded onto our device. Okay. That, that's our first choice approach because that's the easiest we think to get to the regulatory concerns. We do have experiments that are at the earlier stage that are looking at stem cells as well. Because So basically, if you get a, a artificial bio-artificial kidney and it has cadaver stem cells on it, would you still need to take immunosuppressant medication? That's an excellent question. And uh, we believe that we can actually avoid the need for immunosuppressants. And the reason for that is because the cells in the bioreactor are simultaneously isolated from the immune system because they're grown on the membrane. And the membrane, which is designed so that it allows for water, salts, glucose, amino acids, and very other small molecules to pass through, has the pores that don't allow the immune components to attack or identify and attack these cells. It sounds like you have little security guards at the door that won't let the um, the antibodies get through. <laughs> that is correct. More like more like, more, more like a fence. Okay. Okay. Hey, that makes sense to me because I've been learning a lot about antibodies and how they're like, you know, if you think of that game Pac-Man, that's really what they are. They just kind of go around and look for something to attack. And if you don't let them in the door, they can't get it, right? Yes, some, <laughs> something similar along that, absolutely. Uh, except we are providing most of the isolation just by controlling the size of the gate, if you will. Oh, okay. Oh, it's just so fascinating. I mean, was your mom and dad really, really smart? Um, because you, you seem super smart to me, and I, I'm, I'm excited because you need super smart people trying to solve these problems. Well, thank you. My, my, I'd like to think my parents were smart, uh, but <laughs> I think you know what really uh, drives me and my colleagues is that, um, one, we, have, we think this is a problem that's tractable. Mm-hmm. The science is, is largely there. It's fundamentally an engineering exercise. Okay. For a number of reasons, the technologies have not been brought together with the biology to deliver on this, but I think with awareness like you're doing, uh, with uh, support from the community and the funding agencies, we'll be able to deliver on a prototype that will demonstrate feasibility that will allow us to make this a mass-producible device. Well, I was uh, very excited because I know the National Institute of Health um, donated a $6 million grant. Um, to you, which, you know, all of these technologies take resources. And um, on the social media platform, there is a huge following for people who want to, you know, to see this technology progress. You know, what is a feasible time frame if you had the correct funding to have all the researchers working on it? Would it be like five years, 10 years? Um, do you have any kind of idea when this might be available? Sure. Our team has actually um, developed a plan to get this to clinical trials and beyond. So in our estimate, money not being an issue in the ideal world, we think we can get to the initial clinical trials at the end of 2017. Now, there are caveats with that, obviously. Uh, everything has to go according to plan. But we believe that that's a that's the achievable target for the initial clinical trials. And as you may already know, uh, once a device goes into initial clinical trials, there has to be follow-up studies and uh, monitoring. And we think that within, you know, the end of the decade, we should be a device that's available to the community. And you'll get the Nobel Prize for engineering and science, right? What I would really hope for is to be able to deliver a device that makes dialysis a thing of the past. Well, I know, because that's going to happen, and then you're going to get the Nobel. I'm, I'm just thinking of the future, that's all. Um, no. <laughs> well, I'm very, I'm, your, your words are very touching. Thank you. <laughs> well, one of the things that you know I know is, is, is an issue when you're, you're starting a clinical trial. So let's say we fast forward to 2017, and you're able to you know, begin a clinical trial. Um, let's say I wanted to get in the clinical trial, I had kidney failure, and you implanted this device in me, um, and I had a choice to either try the device or go on dialysis. 
Um, I know a lot of people would just assume to try the device before trying dialysis. Would there be any risks to the patient if it didn't work other than surgery? Obviously, we can't predict ahead of time, but we can maybe speculate a little bit. Uh, and the device is designed uh, to contact blood, and you're right, it does require a surgery. So the patient has to be healthy enough to withstand surgery and surgical implantation. Now, the decision whether you should do surgery for the artificial kidney or dialysis, um, everything being equal, is something that you and your physician uh, will have to decide. Uh, we anticipate the device will be uh, implanted by a surgical pr procedure not too dissimilar from what is required in a transplant at the initial um, uh, trials. And then as we improve our technology um, and materials become refined, it is conceivable that much further down the road, it might be even possible to do this using some minimally invasive surgery. And we may want to look at the field of heart failure and the devices that are there. So initially, it used to be open surgeries that would re be required to implant pacemakers. Today, it's very much a surgery that can be done with just a minimal incision. Mm -hmm. We can speculate that we can get to that day where it's done in a similar manner as well. Well, you know, because I was thinking, you know, when we, we have so many needs for clinical trials nowadays, and patients have to understand the risks and benefits of starting a clinical trial. I was just thinking, well, if I had to go on dialysis and I could just maybe opt to try this to see if it worked, I would probably do that and um, to avoid dialysis if I could. And then if it, it didn't work because it's a clinical trial or for whatever reason trying to figure out the clotting situations or trying to figure it out, um, then if it doesn't work, you can just take it out and I have to go on dialysis. <laughs> Nothing lost. So I, I think that that, um, I hope that the FDA listens to that and, and has some leniency in giving patients the choice of understanding the risks and benefits because I think a lot of people would risk to perhaps you know, have the benefit of not having to go on dialysis. So. Yeah, so clearly you're familiar with the programs such as the kidney health initiatives, uh, yes. patient preferences. This would be something we would um, test out with them. We're also working through the expedited access pathway program with at the FDA to streamline the regulatory pathway so we can get this to patients faster in a safe manner. No, it is. I, I think it's very exciting. So if people want to learn about this project, where where can they find more information? Yes, the uh, probably the most accessible way to find out about the project is online. And there are two forums. The one that I think is getting the most um, uh, hits right now is our Facebook uh, web, uh, Facebook site. It's uh, www.facebook.com slash artificial kidney, mm -hmm. and you can uh, look at the updates we post on a regular basis, weekly, if not more than weekly, uh, and as well, you can also sign up on a clinical trials wait list so that when you're at the stage, we can let everybody know uh, oh, that we're looking for uh, patients. The other website is uh, kidney.ucsf. Dot edu UCSF stands for University of California San Francisco and there is more technical material at that website. And how do you go about paying for this project? Is it from you know more grants? Is it from individual donors? How are you making this dream a reality? To date, we have relied largely on grants to get us through the key technical and scientific milestone, and we've received close to ten million dollars from various federal agencies over the last decade. We are at a point where we need to move from the basic science component to implementation. And for that, we really rely on the patient and philanthropy uh, community to assist because that amount, that, that, that kind of money is not readily supported by government grants and we're still too early for the private in business investors. So at this stage, we have some government grants, as you already have mentioned, from NIH, but to move it through animal trials, uh, animal studies, and to the first in man, we'll have to rely on a combination of philanthropy and foundations.
Well, maybe um, maybe we could just give a shout out to Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, and I'm trying to think of anybody else who may have some spare change. Oh, um, we're talking about Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg should just, you know, you're, you're he, he should pitch in. <laughs> so well, absolutely, and everybody, and we can all do our part. I think part of it is raising awareness, as mm-hmm. you very well know. Many people just are not aware, so I think what you're doing is terrific, and everybody in their own way can contribute. Uh, we've had people host, you know, small fundraisers themselves, be online or they've had potlucks. Every bit helps, and I think also in the process raises awareness and brings attention to not only our project but the needs of the kidney disease community. So together, I think we can get to the finish line. No, that sounds wonderful. Well, this um, this is March is Kidney Month, and so I want everybody to think about, you know, spreading the word, um, letting people know that, you know, technology, medical technology changes all the time, and we need to be part of it to make our future better. And I thank you, Dr. Shuvo. You're when I met you at ASN, I'm like, you were such a, a, an inspiring um, engineer because I know you live and breathe this, and we need people like that to be able to make a better future. And I know you're burning the midnight oil to make this a reality. And on behalf of you know patients, I thank you for your dedication. Thank you. And again, as much as I appreciate your kind words for me, there's a team of nephrologists, a team of transplant surgeons, a team of engineers and scientists all working. And I want, and and I I think, you know, patients are part of that team. So I think, I like to think of us, we are all on this, we are all in this together. All right. Well, let's go solve the problem and uh, uh, get rid of the need to have to wait for a kidney. I think that would be amazing. Onwards. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.